we are discussing some management concepts and in the last few two lectures in fact we have discussed number of concepts let us continue with familiarizing ourselves with some more concepts which will help us in understanding overall management studies uh, subjects and perspectives so uh, from the last lecture we move on to the issue of some of the strategic uh, uh, we can say management concepts we have a couple of them so the strategic alliances when we are talking of strategic management we are talking about the strategic alliances strategic alliance this is an agreement between two or more organizations to do business together in a mutually beneficial way. So, strategic alliance enables partners to gain access to each other's resources including markets, technologies, capital and people. This becomes important in today's world of uh, globalization, competition that sometimes the organizations start about their alliances. From here we come to the strategic architecture. When we are talking about strategic management, we need to understand this term strategic architecture which refers to a top management action plan which indicates the new competencies which will be needed in the coming years in, in, in future and uh, how the existing competencies have to be strengthened, how business processes have to be reoriented and the relationship with external entities especially customers and uh, others perhaps this has to be uh, recognized and refigured. So, we are talking about the strategic architecture and we have many examples of strategic architecture for example, we, if when we say that the commitment of people is extremely important. Okay, so, the top management has to look into that, perhaps that becomes an element of that uh, of the this issue. Then we move on to the SPU what we call as the strategic business unit. Every organization has number of units and the strategic business unit is known as, as this is a variation of the divisional structure of an organization. An SPU is an operating unit or division of a corporate group that determines its own strategy largely independent of the corporate center. Usually the SPU will have its own district set of products and services for a customer segment or a geographical region. So, if a company has its uh, head office in Delhi or Mumbai, it may have uh, the, the various offices say uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, remote you know areas uh, say in south, west, east, north, anywhere and then looking at the geographical uh, perhaps you know um, regional uh, requirements there may be certain strategies for business. Then we uh, are discussing the strategic control. Strategic control refers to uh, a defined system to support managers in assessing the relevance of the organization's strategy to its progress in the accomplishment of its goals 
and when discrepancies exist to support needing attention. A strategic control system links operations to strategic goals and it also aligns financial and non-financial information to support business decisions and we need this in order to have very good business management uh, particularly again and I will repeat that in today's uh, scenario. Stakeholders, we are talking about in, in an organization that there are employees, there are stakeholders, there are uh, decision makers, we are talking about all on the persons those who are playing some roles and stakeholders when we are talking about this we mean by stakeholder the groups whose interests are directly or indirectly affected by the company's activities. Stakeholders, employees, managers, creditors, suppliers, contractors, agents, distributors and customers. The local community can also be considered to be a stakeholder. Management of relationships with stakeholders has become an important and integral part of a CEO's job. This is becoming an important part of what is being popularly referred to as the co corporate social responsibility about which we will be discussing later. Then the issue of strategic fit is coming. The strategic fit is a term which is commonly used in the mergers and acquisitions. The extent to which the activities of two organizations complement each others and uh, in other words we can say hmm, that the potential for generating synergies. The benefits of good strategic fit includes they may include cost reduction uh, due to uh, economies of scale and due to transfer of knowledge and skills. So, we may have this strategic fit where we may share knowledge and uh, we may do you know lot of uh, sort of implementation, experimentation and then decide you know about certain business uh, strategy. Strategic inflection point. This is a point of dramatic change in an industry that is known as strategic inflection point. We are discussing th this because in uh, the this era of strategic management, we need to acquaint ourselves uh, also with some of these uh, uh, these uh, concepts uh, because uh, that is something uh, we can say uh, additional uh, to the to the literature of management when we are talking about the strategic management concepts. And so as and as I said last uh, in my last lecture, the objective of discussing all this is to to paint a picture or to to present a uh, some sign, uh, some sign, uh, 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 some sort of a uh, um, view to you, so that you may be able to understand that in terms of management, what concepts are um, becoming more important these days. So the we move on to the strategic intent now. Strategic in intent. We mean the uh, leveraging of internal resources, capabilities and core competencies by a firm to accomplish its goals in the competitive environment. Uh, we can also say this is a dream that energizes a company by 
uh, setting uh, uh, stretch targets, providing a sense of uh, uh, destiny, we can say, to the company's employees. So, so in in other words, you know, this is the the intent intent of the organization, uh, in which you know perhaps we are also uh, involving um, employees and other members of the organization to actually come to certain uh, decision or certain conclusions. Then coming to uh, the issue of strategic market, a market which scores high on either market potential or learning potential or both for an MNC, multinational corporation. A strategic market demands significant commitment of human and material resources. Then we come to strategic planning. When we are looking at the strategic uh, management, uh, planning is an important aspect of uh, the whole process of managing. So, the strategic planning. Strategic planning is the determination of the basic long term goals and objectives of an organization and adoption of courses of action and the allocation of resources necessary to achieve these goals. So, when we are discussing the strategic planning, uh, this is determination of the basic long term goals that is that's, that's very uh, important. And then we are trying to uh, again you know when we are doing this long, long term goals, we have you know the, the strategies where we will involve people in uh, decision making. So, the strategic planning uh, will uh, becomes necessary to uh, achieve the goals of the organization in today's world. From here, we move on to uh, talk about a concept called stress. Some of you must be wondering why are we talking about the stress. The stress, the other day uh, there was a, um, there was a um, news item which said that the man managers uh, perhaps in developing countries uh, are more stressed than many other countries. So, the stress becomes an important uh, aspect when we are looking at the overall managing. So, from that new uh, news uh, item, let us see now what do we really mean by stress and its implications. And stress is a dynamic condition in which an individual is confronted with an opportunity, constant or demand related to what he or she desires and for which the outcome is perceived to be both uncertain and important. That is Robin, Robbins has given this definition uh, and so from there you know I picked up this. So, we can see that stress becomes an important uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, managing an organization. So, so how much of stress and uh, um, how do we design uh, the work you know, for um, different levels that becomes an extremely important. Here we are looking at stress you know, from the point of view of organization uh, uh, aspect. We are not looking at the, the uh, some of the psychological uh, stress which the individual you know, might have otherwise. We are, not, we are not talking about that, even though that is also an important aspect you know, for the manager has to understand if after all the full, uh, the, we are looking at you know the uh, work family interface also these days and uh, um, that balancing you know work and family relationship that also we are talking about these days. So, if a person is under stress even at home, that stress you know he might you know sometimes carry to the place of work. But here the more reference you know um, for us is to, to at the place of work you know how do we design um, the working system, that is the re reference here. Uh, 
from here we move on to uh, succession, succession planning. It refers to the process of identifying and preparing people for assuming greater responsibility. It assumes that a vacant positions are filled smoothly and CEO level succession planning is a challenging task. So, so we have to see that how the succession planning has to be done keeping in view various um, parameter. So, these parameters the CEO has to actually look into in terms of the uh, ma ma many aspects like the time factor, the availability of, uh, of people in the market, uh, the expertise available and uh, perhaps what are the goals that we have to achieve and so on. So, so uh, in uh, uh, this uh, issue the CEO's role becomes an extremely important, uh, important function perhaps. So, uh, from here uh, we are moving to the uh, issue of supply chain management. In the recent years, one of the important management uh, concepts that has emerged is about the supply chain management. This is an emerging school of thought we can say, uh, which lays emphasis on taking an integrated view of the entire value addition process stretching from suppliers uh, to customers and customers from customers to customers we can say and it refers to the flow of materials from the primary sources through various stages to the uh, to the final um, user final customer so how the whole supply chain chain actually is functioning that becomes very important for us in the overall business uh, scenario and uh, otherwise uh, sometimes you know one might think that we are producing very good things but then you know that's not enough we have to see the supply chain uh, aspect uh, and how do we design that aspect so uh, from here we move, move to a very important aspect of management. In fact, uh, you would recollect that when we were talking about uh, the whole introduction uh, of the of the uh, of the concept of uh, management uh, studies in our earlier lectures, one of the objectives or one of the goals that we were discussing was that we must have the quality and productivity uh, uh, in terms of the performance of the organization. So, if we are producing something and if there is no quality in that, then we may be producing any, any lot. The, it cannot sustain the, in, the, in the market. So, in order to really uh, achieve you know the good profits and the competitive advantage, we need to have the quality and so the movement of total quality management that has come up and which is now there you know in all spheres of, of, uh, of uh, the management uh, system is not only in the production management and uh, we call it TQM or the total quality management. Total quality management is the integration of the functions and the processes within an organization in order to achieve continuous improvement in the quality of goods and services. So, TQM represents a new approach to quality and uh, as uh, we will see that uh, the total quality management is a, is a systems approach that considers interactions between the various elements of the organization. The subsystems of the organizations include design, planning, production, distribution, field services and various management services. 
from here we are again you know looking at some uh, few, few other aspects of the total quality management. Total quality management also believes that there is a scope for continuous improvement in any of the product processes or services. Remember, if we are also talking about ser services uh, in, in the total quality management. So, that means, you know the expectation of the uh, of the buyer is that in everything there has to be a quality whether it is a product or the serv services. A basic notion of total quality management is that quality is essential in all functions of business and uh, external uh, and the external factors. Well, uh, it's not correctly written. Um, Im implementing uh, total quality management involves a cultural shift and change in behavior of employees. And total quality management, if implemented effectively, leads to lower costs, improved productivity, and competitive advantage in the long run. So, what we are seeing the total quality management as a movement has become an extremely important uh, concept for us and all of us wherever we are, we have to see that we have achieved the best quality in whatever we do. And uh, that actually is the success of, uh, of managing. After discussing total quality management, now we discuss uh, value chain. Let us see what is the meaning of value chain. Value chain is a framework for analyzing the various activities a firm performs to add value for its customers. By analyzing the value chain, the firm can understand where it is strong and of course, where it is weak and how it can further streamline the value addition process. Every organization has a value chain and this becomes an important concept for us for organizational functioning. Now, we move on to goal setting theory. Goal setting theory is part of the motivation process and this theory states that specific and difficult goals with goal feedback lead to higher performance. Yes, this is one of the important theories in the motivation literature of motivation, work motivation. And uh, this also relates to job design or work design. And work design we understand as the allocation of specific work tasks to individuals and groups. Then we are talking about job uh, enlargement. In fact, uh, goal motivation, uh, the uh, goal setting and work motivation and job enlargement, these are all aspects of the motivation, uh, the concept of motivation. Job enlargement, this is actually part of uh, one of the theories of job design, when we are talking about a strategy that increases task variety by combining into one job, two or more tasks that were previously assigned to separate workers. Job enlargement. Suppose, there is a car manufacturing company and there are workers in the assembly line and earlier every person was supposed to uh, put you know perhaps uh, only uh, the uh, some nut and bolt you know in the in the assembly of door of the car. So, for the various jobs there were various persons. 
Now, when we say job enlargement, that means the whole door assembly is done by the same person. So, his job is enlarged in terms of uh, number of responsibilities that we might give him. So, two or more tasks are there which are enlarging. So, it was found that if you enlarge the job of people by giving more responsibility, perhaps there is greater intrinsic motivation. And so, this finds a place in our understanding of work motivation and the management process. As, uh, as uh, against job enlargement, we have job enrichment, where we are trying to enrich the job in terms of the, the uh, quality of, of job. And job enrichment, when we uh, do our lectures on uh, motivation, you will find that we are talking to uh, talking about Herzberg's theory. And uh, this is an outcome of that theory and job enrichment refers to vertical expansion of job, which has number of characteristics which will make the job enriching. And uh, the number of char characteristics that uh, we are talking about, well, I will just mention the characteristics short while from now. Job enrichment increases the degree to which the workers control the planning, execution and evaluation of his or her own job. And the characteristics uh, uh, of job also increase employee freedom and independence, responsibility and provide feedback to assess the correct performance. We are talking about job enrichment. In fact, later we will see Herzberg's theory, which is also known as job enrichment theory. One of the, one of the uh, names used for job um, uh, for Herzberg's theory. So, we will see that in details. I am just trying to acquaint you to the concepts of management in, in these lectures. So, the job enrichment theory has number of aspects which are also related later on to the job characteristics theory. They are we are talking about the variety, uh, the uh, various types of skill, variety, the kind of a feedback that you have, all these things you know as part of job enrichment process. Job analysis is yet another concept that we use. Uh, mainly uh, in the literature of HR, when we are trying to uh, recruit people or allocate job to people. So, job analysis means developing a detailed description of tasks involved in a job, determining the relationship of a given job to other jobs and ascertaining the knowledge skill and abilities necessary for an employee to perform the job successfully. So, in fact, you know many a times we first do job analysis and th this is this is a process for every job analysis. So, that you know we can have the best kind of a uh, person uh, work fit for the organization. Then uh, it very, very closely related to this process is the process of job description. And job description is a written statement of what a job holder does, how it is done and why it is done. Yes, job specification is a process that states the minimum acceptable qualifications or attributes that an employee must possess to perform a given job successfully. That is the job specification. If you want to become a teacher, then what are the special acceptable qualification and the attributes uh, which, are, which are required, say you have to be a PhD and you should be 
liking, you know, to teach and, and uh, speak, communicate, meet people, okay, patient and so on. Okay, so like that there are every job, you know, has such certain job specifications. For example, communication may not be very, very uh, important, you know, if you are just working at the shop floor in a big way, even though we all understand communication is a good uh, skill, you know, that may be required for most of the jobs, but okay, when you are teaching perhaps more requirement of this attribute. So, very closely related to the motivational uh, models or job enrichment model that we have discussed earlier is another model which we call as the job character characteristics model. And uh, Herzberg's model and job characteristics model, these are models of job design and in this model we find that the identification of job characteristics have been emphasized and so the five uh, job characteristics and their relationships to personal and work outcomes are emphasized. So, here the skill variety, task identity, task significance, autonomy and feedback, these are the job characteristics which have been emphasized by, um, by researchers and thinkers. In fact, uh, one of the uh, formulations of have also been developed uh, of the MPS, the motivating potential score for which I have not made you know any, uh, any presentation for, for you, but MPS is motivating potential score where we have skill plus task skill variety plus task identity plus task significance, the average of that, average of all this. So, we add all these and then multiply by the autonomy and feedback. The idea is that autonomy and feedback have the multiplicative quality. So, they are more, more important perhaps uh, in the work situation. So, the job uh, characteristics uh, model has talked about motivating potential score of a job, which we, uh, this we will discuss uh, when we are doing our, uh, our uh, um, chapter on work motivation again. I, I have just you know tried to put this uh, the meaning of all these uh, for you, maybe you are uh, interested skill variety for example, let us see. A skill variety is the degree to which a job requires a variety of different activities, task identity, task identity yes, refers to the degree to which the job requires completion of a whole identifier identifiable piece of work, task identity. You identify yourself, you know, with that uh, the, the duties, you know, of, of, of the task. So, the completion of a whole task that is given to you. Then the significance of task, task significance and task autonomy. The autonomy, the degree to which the job provides substantial freedom and discretion to the individual in scheduling the work and in determining the procedures to be used in carrying it out the autonomy uh, in uh, at the place of work. So, as managers you know we have to be very careful about it that people also need some autonomy uh, while, they, while they are um, doing their uh, duties and their, their work. So, autonomy becomes extremely important and as we have seen that autonomy and feedback have to be multiplied if we are looking at the 
motivating potential score of a particular job, then feedback is extremely important which refers to the degree to which carrying out the work activities required by a job results in the individual obtaining direct and clear information about the effectiveness of his or her performance. Feedback that means you can say in a way it is a knowledge of a result in a way that whatever you have done, is it all right, is it good, is it bad, do you need an improvement that has great motivating potential. Otherwise, you do the work and you do not know where do I stand, what your manager wants. So, as a manager you have to see that you are able to give very good feedback to your employees or your juniors or your subordinates because that has motivating potential. You will be liked as a manager if you are very positive in giving feedback. Even the negative things you know you can put you know in a very very positive way. So, feedback becomes extremely important for improvement of work performance of any employee and that has motivation, motivation uh, potential yes, but how do we go about it? Perhaps you need uh, an excellent training in leadership on communication yes. So, now I move on to I am I, I, do you recollect what are we doing in these lectures I am trying to acquaint you to the concepts of management which in each chapter perhaps you know these concepts will appear in uh, all the all these concepts will appear in some chapter or the other in some reference or the other. Now, let us see leadership. Leadership is the process of inspiring others to work hard to accomplish important tasks. We all have the concept of leadership in our mind, we all know that there had been leaders you know in the history there are leaders, but a manager should also be a leader that is the idea. So, when we are going to discuss leadership we will have more more uh, ideas you know on, on leadership, but uh, a few ideas I would like to certainly give you by acquainting you with the concepts the transactional leadership there are different types of leadership, but some of the ideas which have come, come up in the recent years. Transactional leadership is that leadership which directs the efforts of the others through tasks, reward and structure, which directs through the tasks, rewards and structure. So, there is a transaction between people is not an autocratic leadership where perhaps the transaction goes only from one side and the command and that is it. In transactional we have transaction from both the sides. Then uh, transformational leadership where we are trying to transform, we are leading yet you know there is a transformation process. This is the ability of a leader to get people to do more than they originally expected to do in support of large scale innovation and change. And so, we are trying to transform the, uh, the uh, issue or the relationship from whatever wherever it was to a slightly different level. Okay. If it was A then perhaps A dash you have you know a different kind. Coming to the managerial competency we define it as a skill or personal characteristics that contribute to high performance in a management job. 
Well, I am using the term define, but sometimes I am describing also. Main idea is that I am trying to make, uh, acquaint you to, uh, to uh, management concepts, I am presenting a scenario of, of management concepts. Okay. So, I am um, often using the word define, but sometimes I am uh, defining or describing. Okay, because for certain concepts sometimes you know a perfect definition uh, may or may not be available, but description of the process may be available. So, so, so when I am using these words, I am sometimes using it interchangeably, so keep that in mind. So, after managerial uh, competency, uh, we are moving on to workforce diversity. Workforce diversity, we know that uh, workforce is diverse and managers you know have to keep uh, uh, keep them themselves you know ready to actually uh, meet with this challenge so this term becomes important into this context this is a term used to describe demographic differences such as age gender race ethnic groups able bodied or uh, we can say handicapped people okay disabled people among other members of workforce and workforce diversity of course uh, the other side of workforce diversity is also about different race and different uh, country and different uh, perhaps uh, religion. So, in, in workforce diversity also these uh, issues come and the people from different countries uh, and these days with globalization as we know that on um, that uh, people from different countries, different race, different religion, uh, different gender they are all working together and so the concept becomes extremely important in today's time. Then uh, from here I move to organizational effectiveness. In our introduction we have talked about one of the major goals uh, of uh, learning about management uh, as a subject is to have the best quality total quality management and finally we have the competitive advantage and effective organizations. So, effective organization we are, we are defining defined as a capacity to survive, adopt, maintain itself and grow regardless of a particular function it fulfills. So, organizations may be of many types which we will see later in our lectures and when we say an effective organization, then whatever be the, the our final product or final uh, function for final task, we have to survive, grow, adopt, maintain and perhaps you know uh, be alive in the today's competitive uh, environment. So, that is the effectiveness. So, when we are talking about effectiveness and uh, productivity of an organization, we are not talking about productivity in a particular year uh, or particular slice of time. We are talking about organizational performance, if you draw the graph, the performance must be consistent and perhaps growing. Okay. So, it is not the slice of time that only the say the year 2005 uh, the uh, organization made this much profit and uh, something of that kind. So, it is very effective. No, that is just one parameter of that particular year, but we have to grow, we have to survive, we have to maintain and we have to really renew ourselves. So, organizational effectiveness is a total process which, which, which is talking about so many things, profit is just one of the things in organizational effectiveness. Here we are making that distinction uh, with, with uh, certain other uh, points of views. And uh, so, from here 
we move on to some other concepts. We will now see the concept of industrial relations. Industrial relations is the field, one of the important fields in management and that looks at relationship between management and workers, particularly workers union and organizations. We, uh, we talk about industrial relations also in terms of uh, some aspects like a discipline which is committed to a policy advocating a secure, safe and fair go and good quality of at the place of work. This in turn creates a balance between employees and employers of the organization. I should have written it here employers creates a balance between employees and employers of the organization. So, you understand that in the industrial relations concept, we have number of factors where we are talking about issues of participative management and so on. Activity based management uses detailed economic analysis of important business activities to improve strategic and operational decisions. It in increases the accuracy of cost information by more precisely linking overhead and other indirect costs using basis such as direct labor hours, machine hours and the material costs. Yeah, we are talking about a combination of these costs to optimize the performance results of the organization. Then we come to organization development popularly known as OD. Ben is one of the uh, authorities in this field. He defined OD as a response, well there are many, many definitions, but uh, uh, well I picked up uh, Benis defined OD as a response to change a complex uh, and this is a complex educational strategy intended to change beliefs, attitudes, values and structure of organizations, so that they can better adapt to new technologies, market and challenges and seeing the rate of change itself. When we are talking about feedback, a, a term which has become very popular these days is 360 degrees feedback and this refers to, in fact this is also known as a multi-rater feedback and multi-rater feedback uh, in the earlier years you know when we were talking about this. Uh, for example, when I conducted this study some 25 years ago, uh, at that time the multi-rater feedback concept that we had taken was that there are supervisor, immediate supervisor or, or your uh, say co-worker, something of that multi-rater or the chief manager or something of that kind. But now the 360 feedback, this is uh, taking a multi-source uh, feedback. And this multi source uh, ass uh, assessment is uh, uh, done through the employee development feedback that comes from all around the uh, employee. That means, uh, uh, everyone or most of the people in the organization, those who are those who could perhaps give feedback about yourself, will give feedback, not, not each and every, but maybe in your department, your colleagues, and, and others. So, the feedback would come from subordinates, peers and managers in the organizational hierarchy as well as assessment and in some cases external sources and the customers and suppliers or, or all others interested 
stakeholders might also give you feedback, which could be uh, about performance in terms of uh, any aspect of the organization or of the person. So, this is one of the uh, one of the uh, I will say uh, new methods of uh, analyzing performance feedback in organizations for effective management system. Then uh, we are talking about uh, well industrial relations we have already dis discussed. Let me just see whether I can So, we have talked about uh, so many concepts in this uh, these three lectures and uh, this has given you fairly good idea about certain concepts uh, of management. Now, during the course uh, the whole course you know that we are going to discuss in each chapter you will find that some reference to these concepts will be seen. So, I close here and uh, we move on to uh, different chapters and then you will find that uh, once again you know the reference to some of these concepts will emerge. I hope now this has given you, uh, given you some idea about the scenario of management that we have uh, today as part of um, the, um, the academic study or as part of your training. And uh, then we move on to the other uh, topics, okay, that is it for today.